Good morning and happy Sabbath. That's better. Usually on the first time, everybody's just, never mind. <laughs> I'm thankful for this opportunity to once again study with you guys' word. And are you ready to study today? Yeah. Are you ready to eat? Not just literally, but spiritually. Yeah. We got enough bread here for everybody, even for people online as well. Now, this is uh, part two of a study that I started in March called Understanding the Times. And we're going to be looking a little bit more deeper into the sanctuary and also some of the feast days as well. There are going to be some little short studies in the middle, but hopefully, praise God, that it all tie in together because, yeah, I, I, I have too much on my time, <laughs> too much in my hands to, to do. But before we get started, let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you once again, and we thank you for this Sabbath rest, Lord, you have set aside for us, Lord. And Lord, we just ask for your Holy Spirit to fall upon us, Lord, and Lord, we just ask that you continue to be with me, Lord, to help me decrease and let you increase, Lord, in this message, Lord. Bless us now. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Now, and I want to recommend a few books to help, you know, get us deep into this study, uh, one is called Christ in the Sanctuary. I don't know how many have heard of that book. Uh, the Cross and the Shadows. And then if you read The, uh, the Great Controversy, uh, Chapter 23, those are the books that kind of been helping me, besides, as well as the Bible, to help me get into this message a little bit deeper. But uh, let's begin. The last time we were together, we learned that the world is in the unrest. Has anything changed from when I present this last time or today? And as we draw close to the end, as one event is being revealed, God has, has called on us to deliver a last day message to the world. Amen? The servant of the Lord said on page 19 of Testimonies for the Church, volume 9, that in a special sense, we have been set in the world as both as a watchman and a bearer of the light to proclaim this truth. God has called on, uh, called on us to spread the knowledge of the truth, found only of the word, word of God to others. And what is needed right now, friends, is Jesus. Because God needs the people who understands Christ, who understands his message, and can stand to give the loud cry. But we run into a, a curveball during these times. Here's the problem. As a people, we are not ready for the things to come. Inspiration tells us in early writings, page 119, in the first sentence of paragraph one, I saw the remnant was not prepared for what is coming upon the earth. Then later on in this paragraph, she said, my accompanying angel cry out with an awful solemnity, get ready, get ready, get ready, for the fierce anger of the Lord is soon to come. His wrath is to be poured out unmixed with mercy, and ye are not ready. Rend the heart and not the garment. A great work must be done for the remnant. And later on in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, Chapter 3 and Page 24, once again, inspiration tells us, a crisis is right upon us. We must now proclaim the great truths of these last days by the Holy Spirit power. It would not be long before everyone has heard the warning and decided, then shall the end come. Why must we, why must we proclaim these truths? On page 60, 61 of the same books, he tells us our message is a life or death message. Is that true, friends? We need to know what our message is based on the Bible and understand this message because it is the only solution for the world. Are we in danger right now during these times of not understanding our message? Yes. Watch this. Inspiration tells us in the book Evangelism, page 363, paragraph 2, under the section entitled Danger and Ignorance of our, of our Past History. We want to study and understand doctrines that have been studied out carefully and prayerfully. It has been revealed to me that there is among our people a great lack of knowledge. <clears throat> if we lack knowledge, then what are we, friends? Unfortunately, ignorant. And I don't mean that in a hateful way. Because the mighty prophet Hosea tells us once again in chapter 4 of his book, in verse 6, that my people are destroyed due to a lack of what? Knowledge. In, regard, in regards to the rise and progress of the third angel's message as he finishes up. There is a great lack of knowledge as it relates to our message. 
Even as we speak, the devil is trying to cause us to be ignorant of our history, to not know our identity, that he wants us to depart from the faith because he knows there is a faith that can explain what is going on right now. How are we, how are we going to understand the reason of our faith? In paragraph three of the book Evangelism, page 363, the pen of inspiration once again tells us, in many places having so many servants or substitutes, she said in place of having so many servants, she said there should be more close searching of the word of God. To paraphrase, she said, we need more study and less preaching. She said there should be more close searching of, of the word, uh, yeah, there should be more search more close searching of the word of God. To, par to paraphrase that, yeah, once again, we need more studying and less preaching. Which is going to help us get ready for the crisis, studying or, or preaching? Studying. She said, opening the scriptures text by text and searching for strong evidence that sustains the fundamental doctrines that have brought us where we are now upon the platform of eternal truth. We got to go back to the Bible because most of us don't even know the distinct message that God has given us during these times that will help us and others to stand before the storm that is rapidly coming. To paraphrase, inspiration tells us that we need to search for strong evidence that sustain the fundamental doctrines that has led us to become Seventh-day Adventist Christians, to tell the world that the Bible contains the everlasting gospel, that the Bible defined for us what is truth from Genesis to the book of Revelation, the Bible revealed to us the plan of redemption and how to gain victory over sin. It revealed to us that the Bible is the inspired word of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which we know is the spirit of prophecy. Because we have a more sure word of prophecy, the Bible tells us that the day star, the root of offspring of David, will arise in our heart. Amen? Are you ready to continue to understand our life and death message? To understand our message and our identity, where, where do we need to go to get understanding? Turn, turn to me to Psalm 73. This is our message today, our, our verse today. Psalm 73 and verse 17. We read it earlier. It tells us, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understand their end. The sanctuary, based on this text, is a place of what? Understanding. So if I want to understand the doctrine that God has given us to help us understand our identity, where do I need to go? The sanctuary. Why? Because thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Psalm 77 and verse 13. Now, question, how many parts are in the sanctuary? Three. And what are they? They're the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place. Let's look at the furniture of the sanctuary from the east to the west. In the outer court, you have the, art burn of sac the, the altar of burnt sacrifice. As we proceed forward from there, you will come to the laborer which is filled with water. Then you will come to the tent inside of which are two, two apartments. Inside the first apartment, which is called the holy place, there, there are three pieces of important furniture. On the right is the table of soul bread. On the left, you have the golden candlestick. And lastly, in front of the inner veil in the middle, you have the altar of incense. Finally, as you leave the holy place to enter the most holy place, you have the Ark of the Covenant with two cherubim placed on each side, and on the top you have the mercy seat. Amen? In studying the sanctuary system, we are taught how we can once again have face-to-face -face communion with God. Because Jesus tells us he is the way, according to John chapter 14 and, and verse 6. This means that when we look into the sanctuary, we should see a revelation of Jesus Christ, because each piece of furniture revealed to us who Jesus Christ is. And many lessons can be pulled from the study of the sanctuary. And the devil wants to confuse us about our history, identity, and message. For us to understand our, our identity and, and the history of message, inspiration tells us in the last sentence of evangelism, paragraph 2, there is a great need to search the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation and to learn the text thoroughly that we may know what is written. What does thoroughly mean? To be in depth or to be in detail, that to carefully study the word of God on our own. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 to study to sow thyself approve unto God, a workman that needed not to be a same, rightly dividing the word of truth. When we study the Bible, we have to learn not just to stay in one place and learn how to rightly divide the word of, word of truth, put everything in its proper place. This has to be our experience now. 
to not just listen to what the church says or what I have to say or what another minister says, but to study for ourselves to be approved to God, rightfully dividing the word of truth, because a time is coming where we have to stand individually and testify of our faith, which means time is of the essence, friends. How do I know that the time is of the essence? As we see events unfold, as we see God slowly restrain the four winds of Revelation chapter 7, as they're slowly being let loose, as we're trying to grasp the reality of the situation. Every day you can't turn on the news, the radio, radio or social media without hearing something that is prophetic or related to Matthew chapter 24. Amen? Did Jesus understand this? Yes or no? Was he urgent about it? Yes or no? Why was Jesus ur urgent about it? Because he knew that, that there was a limit, and we studied that last week. Well, last time. In the Bible, nobody was more urgent than Jesus. Watch this. Please open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew. We're going to look at a few verses to help confirm this. Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 15, what did Jesus say to John before he was baptized? When you get there, please say amen. He said, suffer it to be so, so now. He didn't say suffer, suffer tomorrow. He said, suffer it be so now, for thus it become us, become us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus understood that he had to be baptized on time. Go with me to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1. In verse 14 and 15, the Bible tells us, Now after John was, was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Jesus understood stood that the time has been fulfilled. Now go with me to John. John chapter 13. In John, chapter 13. In John, chapter 13, and verse 27, what did Jesus say to Judas? That thou, thou doest do quickly. Jesus said that all these things must come upon this generation in Matthew, chapter 23, and verse 36. Why? Because he understood the urgency. And once we understand the time, and the plan of redemption. It would create inside us a spirit, spirit of urgency. Please open up your Bible to the book of John. Well, we're in John. John chapter 9. John chapter 9 and verse 4. Jesus understand the urgency. This is why he said in John chapter 9 and verse 4, I must work the work of him that sent me. Why it is day, the night coming, when no man can work. Jesus said, I must go to work during the day because once the night comes, I can no longer work. This verse is also speaking to us as well. Amen? Amen? Jesus is telling us that we must get to work now because there's going to be a time where no man can work. Now, question, as we're studying this, and this is a recap from last week. Where did the plan of redemption begin? In the book of Genesis, chapter 3, and verse 15, God presents a prophecy that will help lay down the foundation of the God blueprint and God plan of salvation. And the Bible said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thou head, and thou shalt not bruise his heel. But thou shalt bru bruise his heel. Who is this referring to? Jesus. Why is the plan of redemption so important? Because inspiration tells us in the book, Education, page 125, highlighted in paragraph 2, the central, three, the central theme of the Bible, the theme of, about which every other book, every other in the whole book cluster is the redemption plan, the restoration in the human soul of the image of God. Inspiration tells us that all the verses in the Bible are trying to reveal to us the plan of redemption and how God is trying to restore in man the image of God. Every verse, every chapter, every book, is to unfold this wonderful theme and to give us a better understanding as well. And he understands that time is of the, of the essence. 
and he understands the urgency. Because if Jesus is no, no longer able to work for our salvation, with the spirit, spirit of the Lord, when the Spirit of the Lord is gone from this world, will the truth be heard anymore? Will the everlasting gospel still be preached? Will God convict you to confess your sins and turn away from them anymore? The answer, unfortunately, is no. Brothers and sisters, many have had the opportunity of hearing this everlasting gospel, the revelation of Jesus Christ, but many don't understand they need. And what the world needs now is Jesus. His time is of the essence. Amen? Watch this. From Christ's Object Lesson, page 177, highlighted in paragraph 5, the pen of inspiration tells us the world has become bold in the transgressions of, of God's law because of his long forbearance. Man has trampled upon his authority. Authority. They have straightened one another in oppression and cruelty towards his heritage, saying, How do it God know? And is their, and is their knowledge in the, high, in the highest. But there is a line beyond which they cannot pass. The time is near where they, they will reach and prescribe limits. Even now, they have almost exceeded the bounds of the long-suffering of God, the limits of his grace, the limits of his history. The Lord will interpose to vindicate his honor, delivering his people, and repress the swelling of the unrighteous. This tells us that Jesus understands there is a limit. Amen? If Jesus understands there is a limit, then today we must understand why there is a limit. And where do I go to get understanding once again? The sanctuary. What did Jesus study in relation to the sanctuary? I think that's the last question that I asked in the previous uh, message. This is the question we're going to answer today. Because the old sanctuary system of the Bible can teach us about the times that we are living in. But how? What do I need to study? I'll, I'll help us out here on this part. The shadows. And what's another name for the shadows? Types. Does the Bible speak of the sanctuary being a shadow? Yes. In the Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, Paul said the Old, Old Testament earthly sanctuary is an example and a shadow of heavenly things sown to Moses. Question, where, where in the sanctuary do I begin? In Great Controversy, page 398, paragraph 4, inspiration tells us arguments drawn from the testimony type also pointed to the autumn as when the event represented by the cleansing of the sanctuary must occur. This was made very clear attention was given to how the types relating to the first advent of Christ has been fulfilled. She said arguments are drawn from the Old Testament. Uh, types. What is another, another word for types? Shadows. I also pointed to the autumn as the, as the time when event. Notice how time and event are connected. To understand the times, I, I must first look at the events uh, connected. Represented by the cleansing of the sanctuary, which only, ha which only happened when, on the Day of Atonement, must take place. This was made clear how, as attention was given to the matter or the way in which the types related to the first advent of Christ has been revealed. As our pioneers begin to study the sanctuary, they understand the study of the shadows of the sanctuary can help us understand the time. Did Jesus follow this method? Yes. The shadows or the types help him understand the time. The types or the shadow help Jesus understand the work of his first advent and, and help our pioneers and even us today to help us understand the times that we are in. Amen? She continues, the slaying of the Passover lamb was a shadow of the death of Christ. Say, Paul, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The Passover, back then, pointed to the history of the children of Israel being delivered out of Egypt and pointed towards Christ and the deliverance he will bring from, from sin by dying as our Passover lamb at the cross. It was also designed around a specific season and a specific time, and there is a specific work to take place that God had, had a specific goal that he was trying to accomplish when it came to his people and acknowledging the, the feast days or the, or the events occur. When Jesus understood the Passover and the, type of, and the type of shadows of it, it helped him understand something about himself. Let's go back a little bit. What happened at the first Passover in connection to Jesus? Let's do a brief study over it. Turn with me to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 12, there's a few things I want to point out 
that's not in connection to today's study, but just in case there's somebody online, I want to answer that question as well. A few things I want to point out. In verse 2 of Exodus chapter 12, the Bible shows us when the Passover starts. This month shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the, the year first month to you. There's a correlation between this and how we view the New Year's now. But this is not a part of the study, like I said, for those watching from home. But let me say this before we go any further in the study. Because I'm not saying that January coincides with the literal Passover. Because the Passover originate, originally begins in the spring. The New Year begins in the spring. Once again, this is not advocating for people to go to a Jewish calendar or telling you that you must keep the feast days. As we continue to study... And we continue these studies, you will see why, amen? In verse 27, this is where we're going to go. In verse 27, the Bible said the Passover is a sign of deliverance. It's a, it's a sign of God's deliverance of his people from Egypt. Once again, the Passover signifies God's deliverance, delivering his people from Egypt. And what does Egypt represent according to Exodus 20 and verse 2? Bondage. Bondage to what? Everyone would, would agree that, that the Israelites were bondage to literal Egypt. But let's apply spiritual application to this. What else were their bondage to? Sin. As we continue to search study on the Passover, it will reveal to us that God wants to deliver us from the bondage of sin that we have been, been struggling with, with the, in the previous year. Christ desired to give us the power to gain victory over sin. Through his blood and sacrifice, who wants to experience gaining victory over sin today, friends? <clears throat> as we study God's word today, we should also use this as a time to examine ourselves, asking for the Lord to reveal to us what sins did I struggle with last year. Help me identify those, those sins. I see you, you want to create inside me a new heart so I can have a new experience with you. You want to transform it, it, me into a new character, I mean, into a new creature and stand as a testimony to those struggling in the same sins. Amen? Is that your prayer today? Then let us continue to analyze and see the principles of how God wants to do that. Amen? Notice in each of the verse we look at earlier, it said that the, the Lord that brought, brought them out of Egypt, it was the Lord that brought them out of the house of bondage, the bondage of sin, which means if God can do the same for them, he could do the same for us. This is why it's important for us to study and learn that there is victory over sins, friends. But notice in verse 3 of Exodus chapter 12, what type of animal had to be sacrificed at the Passover? It reads, Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for the house. Question, what type of animal had to be sacrificed? A lamb. A lamb, but not just any ordinary lamb. What condition of the lamb must be? Verse 5, you shall, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or the goats. A lamb without what, friends? Blemish. A perfect lamb, yes? Who else does, does this, who does this lamb in Exodus chapter 12 symbolize once again? Jesus Christ. Now go to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, speaks of Jesus as our great high priest of the heavenly sanctuary. Notice what else the Bible said about Christ. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The lamb represents Jesus Christ, a perfect lamb without blemish. What makes us blemish, friends? Sin. And what does Jesus want to cleanse us from? Sin. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, a familiar verse after John the Baptist sees Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes takes it away the sins of the world the sin of the world right now where would this work be performed in the most holy place of this heavenly sanctuary inspiration tells us 
in Christ of the Sanctuary, page 67, paragraph 2. The sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work in the behalf of man. It concerned every soul living upon the earth. It opened to, to view the plan of redemption, bringing us down to the very close of time, revealing the triumphant issue of the contest between righteousness and sin. It is of the uttermost importance that all should thoroughly investigate these subjects and be able to give to everyone that asketh them a reason for the hope that is, that is in them. She said the sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work on behalf of man. It concerned every soul. And this is a worldwide work that requires a worldwide wide message. Has God calling us to deliver this message? Yes or no? And notice when we go back to verse 3 of Exodus chapter 12, how the lamb was brought into the home on the 10th day. Then in verse 6, it says they were to keep the lamb for, uh, for 14 days. During the 14 days, they are to care for it, cherish it. Why? So when the time comes to sacrifice the lamb, the family will mourn for the lamb and they care, that they care for and cherish. This is an object lesson from Christ. The Passover will point to the work that Christ is called to do on our behalf. Also, this signifies a new year and deliverance from the bondage of sin, from the bondage of Egypt, which is symbolized as bondage to, to sin. Who did the Passover service point to? Jesus Christ. Let's look at another verse. Please open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, notice what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, another familiar, familiar verse. It says, purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even as Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Once again, we see Jesus Christ, the lamb, the Passover lamb, without blemish. Jesus died at the time of, of Passover. He was he was the Lamb of God slain for our sins, just like the, the Lamb in the first Passover. Question, what time did Jesus die? At 3 p.m. Or, or the night hour, if we follow the original principle of understanding the time, does the Bible confirm that? Yes, write down Matthew chapter 27 and verse 45. Let's continue to, to study the symbolism of the Passover and the work of the Lamb. Notice what happened next after the 15 days. They were to kill the lamb, and after the lamb is, sl is slain, highlighted in verse 7 of Exodus chapter 12, it reads, There shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and of the upper door posts of the house. Where was the blood of the lamb to be placed? At the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house. Why? Skip down to verse 22 and 23. The Bible says, And ye shall take the bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that, that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the, at the door of his, of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he said it, when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your house and to smite you. Why was the blood to be, be placed at the two sides in the upper post of the house? To be protected, to protect them from the destroying angel. Every member of, the fa of each family was to be in their house during that time with their doors covered with the blood of the same lamb. This also points to the individual family member being covered by the blood of Jesus, which could cleanse us from sin and protect us from the second death. What is the second death? Well, that's for another time and another study, but let us continue. Now go back to the book of Hebrews at this time with Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Watch this. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14, when, you, when you're there, please say amen. The Bible said, how much more shall the blood of Christ, 
who through eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. When we are covered with the blood of Christ, the Bible said that our conscience will be purged. Our thoughts, our actions, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life will be purged from our minds at once we're covered with the blood of, of Christ. But notice this. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Watch this transformation. Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse 5. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Question, how can I let Christ's mind be in me that was also in him? It's go back to the... Is go back to this experience, being cleansed from all sin of the mind. Is this not your prayer, prayer daily or hourly, friends? Asking for the Lord to help you purge your conscience from dead works. This is speaking of evil thoughts, evil thinking, the evil ways of doing things. With the blood of Christ, all things are possible. Let this mind be in you, which also is, is in Christ Jesus. This is a twofold work. Once our conscience is purged, no longer will we do dead work. I'll explain. Once we allow Christ to come in and cleanse our thoughts, then we will be able to do good works. Works that are, li that are living, meaning works which are after the Spirit, after Christ, the fruits of the Spirit. Go back to there. That's, uh, let's look at this verse again. It tells us, How much more, said the blood of Christ, who through the, the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot, to, to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Let's look at the, this verse at the end. It said, purge your conscience from dead work. Then what is the end result? What must you do after your conscience, your mind is purged? Highlighted at the end of the, end of the verse. It's called for a person to serve the living God. Once our conscience is purged from the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, you're called next to service, friends. Not only service for Jesus Christ, but service to others as well. Do you want this cleansing, friends? This is the purging of the mind. And I know we're in the middle of the year, in 2022. Let us still say goodbye to the old way of thinking of 2021 and the previous years before. Let us examine ourselves and learn a new way of thinking in Christ Jesus. Amen? Once again, we see Jesus as the Lamb, the Passover Lamb, without blemish. Jesus died at the time of Passover. He was the Lamb of God sl slain for our sins, just like the Passover Lamb in the first Passover. Just as the blood of the Lamb was used to cover the individuals within their homes, the same can be seen for us as well. Now I'll go to the book of Romans. There's one more application I want to add to this that is really missing these days. Because this question gets asked a lot, especially with last month's Romans chapter 6 and we're going to look at verse 3 Romans chapter 6 looking at verse 3 it say know ye not that so many of us who was baptized into Christ were baptized into his death therefore we, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we shall also walk in the newness of life. And skip down to verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body, body of sin might be destroyed, then henceforth we should not serve sin. Should we be literally keeping the Passover today, yes or no? Why? Because Christ is our Passover. Remember in verse 3 of Romans chapter 6, it said, Yo ye not, that so many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. We don't have to keep the Passover literally because Christ became that Passover. But how do we commemorate the Passover? Communion is one thing. But another thing that I speak of, learning how to die to self. Also, one the way you can do this as well is through baptism. Because in verse 4 it reads, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ raised up from, from the dead by the glory of, of, of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. 
Let's put out the old man, the old way of sinning, and continue in this year walking in the newness of life. Amen. Then there is one more. I, I, to let you know, there's a total of like five studies within one. I thought there was four, but there's a fifth one. <laughs> but there's one more as we go back to chapter 12 of Exodus. And let's look at uh, verse 8. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 8. Notice what the Bible said. When you get there, please say amen. The Bible said, and they said, said, eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Skip down to verse 15. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your house. For whosoever eateth leaven from bread from the first day until the seventh day, that that so shall be cut off from Israel. For seven days the Jews were to eat unlimited bread and put out the, the leaven inside of the house. How does that apply to us today? We're going to look back at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed to us. According to this verse, what Christ wants to do in 2020 to purge us, I, I, purge out what? The old leaven that ye may be a new lump. Christ wants to do something new in us now as ye are unlimited bread. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed to us. Then in verse 8, therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the old leaven bread of, of sincerity and truth. What does leaven represent? Sin, right? Malice and wickedness. In the spiritual sense, this is why the Jews were to have nothing to do with the leaven during the Passover. Christ, our Passover, wants to purge this old leaven out, this old way of thinking, this old life, the old man, to give, and give us a new heart. And let's just confirm that some more. Please turn to Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12 and in verse 1 Jesus tell us beware ye of the old leaven of the Pharisees which is hypocrisy what is hypocrisy sin according to Isaiah in the book of Isaiah Matthew chapter 23 and verse 8 in this new year Jesus said that we are not to have leaven in our lives in our homes and in our families which means our children as well what's the What's to be in the parents should not be, how can I word this? What's to be seen in the parents that should not be seen in the children? The, the old leaven, the, the old, old ways of thinking, if there's any. I'm not telling you that you're a terrible parent or nothing like that. Don't uh, type it out or whatever. But the Passover, this is our experience. This is the experience that is needed and to need to be studied carefully. If we are going into this, if we came into this new year each day with the same way of thinking as the year before then, we are already starting out the new year in, on, off the wrong track. Let us ask God to teach us lessons that is found in the Passover. Amen? Every day we should ask God for the power to put off the old man of sin, letting go of the malice and wickedness at being sincere and true in seeking out salvation through Jesus Christ. Go back to, to verse 11 of Exodus chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 12, as the Jews partake in the eating of the unleavened bread, how and what condition were they to be in, all right? In verse 11, it says, Thus shall ye eat it, and with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Underline that whole entire scripture, friends. And notice it said that they were to, to eat it with their loins girded, their shoes on their feet, their staff in their hand, and they were to eat it in haste. Why were they clothed and to eat the Passover in haste, to stay vigilant and to be ready to flee Egyptian at a moment's notice? This is speaking of the exodus the Israelites, the, the, the Israelites went through. And as we study the, the purpose of, of the Passover, look at the some practical application that we can apply to our daily walk with God. Uh, what should we be expecting pretty soon? Deliverance. 
Deliver us from the bondage of sin. Amen? There's a hymn, though, that comes into mind, and I think I got the title in here. When I, when I think of Christ as our Passover and being crucified at the cross, with the chorus saying, burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. He is very near to help in our time of needs, to purge our minds, to cleanse us from all sin, and to uplift us to walk in the newness of life. Amen? Now, let's go back to our original study. Once again, the pen of inspiration said in the great controversy, the slaying of the Passover lamb was a shadow of the death of Christ, said Paul. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed to us. Later on, she said, these types were fulfilled not only as to the event, but also the time. Once again, by studying the types of shadows, Jesus understands the time. When he, the true lamb of God, God would, would die, someone would argue or say, well, that's the Passover. That's not related to the death of Christ. The first coming of Christ had nothing to do with the second coming and the world's end. Is that true, friends? No. The first coming directly is, is directly connected to the second coming. Question. In 31 AD, did everything end, ends at the cross? Did the prophetic time clock reset itself once he was crucified on the cross? No, the same shadows that let Jesus know about his time during his first coming are the same shadows that will let us know about our time before the second coming. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. Now all these things are happening unto them for end samples, and they are written for our evidence upon who the end of the world has come. Amen? Now let's question and review. Some of these questions I'm going to help out. What did Jesus study? The types. What's another word for type? Shadows. How many shadows did Jesus study? I'm, I'm looking at some of the, the, the later on members who probably studied this. How many shadows did Jesus study? The, I'll help you out here. There's a total of seven. There are six shadows here on earth, and the seven, seventh shadow is in heaven. What is the first shadow? We just uh, went over it, the Passover. And what is the seventh shadow? The tabernacle. What is the type, what is the antitype to the tabernacle? Let me rephrase this. Where is this antitype fulfilled? In heaven. And once it's fulfilled, that means that the plan of salvation is complete, which means eat and lost become eat and restore under the new heavens and the new earth. Amen? In paragraph 3 of page 399 of the Great Controversy, the pen of inspiration said, In life matter, the types which relate to the second advent must be fulfilled at the time pointed out in the symbolic service. What do we have to study to help us understand the time of the second advent? The symbolic service, the type. To understand the antitype, we must first identify the, the type. Is that clear? The Passover, a shadow or a type, an example of the cross, and that's one type. Remember earlier I said there are seven types. Now, pop quiz, and this is an open book quiz. All you need is your Bible. First question, if the Passover was a shadow or a type, an example of the cross, and this is one of the types, then where can you find the rest of the types in the Bible to help us understand the sanctuary and the plan of redemption, to help us understand the times that we are living in? Let me give you a hint. It's in the earlier books of the Old Testament. In the sanctuary. In, in the book, Leviticus chapter 23. Let's, let's go there. Let's all go there to Leviticus chapter 23. I had a PowerPoint originally designed, but it crashed when I pulled it out of uh, Google Drive trying to save it. I tried to work on it last night, and the power went out in my area. So, yeah, that's why there's no slide today, and I apologize. In the, let's, let's look at this. From now, what we're going to do is cover the dates and times and days of, this, of the feast and build from there. But did you know that these seven types can also help us understand the Sabbath as well? If y'all want to hear a study on that, we'll go over that in the near future. In the book Leviticus chapter 23, let's go to verse 5. 
This is the first one found in verse 5, the Passover. When did it begin? On the 14th day of the first month. Once again, the Passover represents Christ's sacrifice. And we looked at the verse earlier. Uh, you can write down 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, if you haven't uh, uh, did it already. Did everything finish there, yes or no? The second one is found in verse 6 through 8, and that's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This began on the 15th day of the first month, and for seven days, what are they to do? Eat unleavened bread. The unleavened bread represents Christ who rested in the tomb on the Sabbath of Passover weekend, and we'll go over that more in the next study. Reference 1 Corinthians, once again, 5, but go through verse 6. Did everything finish here, yes or no? The, the third one is found in verse 10 through verse 14, and that's the first fruits, which began on the 16th day of the first month. Now, this is in relation to the harvest of the first fruit. The first fruit represents what? Christ's resurrection. And if I'm wrong, also us once the, yeah. The, that's reference, 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 20. Question, did everything finish there? The fourth is found in verse 15 through 22, and that's Pentecost, or 50 days, what is the Bible says. And this began what? The 50th day after the first fruit. Pentecost represents the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which was the early reign in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. In these last days, we are preparing for the outpouring of the latter reign, which is another study that, that I'm excited to get into in Acts chapter 2, 16 to 18. And we will cover that some more. Did everything finish there? No. The fifth is the Feast of Trumpets, which can be found in verse 24 and 25. But when did this begin? The first day of the seventh month. And how long did that last? Ten days. And what did the trumpets represent? The early Advent movement and the first of the three angels' message of Revelation chapter 14. We'll look at this as well. Did everything finish there? No. The sixth day is the day of of atonement, at one of it. Did anybody catch that? <clears throat> Which is found in verses 27 to 32. And it began on the 10th day of the seventh month. And how long did that last? One day. Question, what was supposed to happen on the day of, the, of atonement? The sanctuary was to be cleansed. And that's a Daniel 8:14 reference that I want to, want to bring into attention to everybody. Did everything finish there? No. And finally, you have the Feast of, of the Tabernacle, which is found in verses 35 through 37. And this, this began on the 15th day of the seventh month. How long did that last? Seven days. And the Tabernacle represents heaven. And as we continue this series of studies, you will notice that God had always liked to finish everything to seven. Because seven is, is symbolic and complete. God had designed a specific work to be done for each each feast, and once it is finished, the plan of redemption is, is complete. What if the children of Israel was making preparations for the Passover during the Day of Atonement? It would be the wrong occasion. The children of Israel would be doing the wrong work, and unfortunately, they would be, wouldn't be able to accomplish the goal that God has raised them up for such a time, time as that. Now, what about us? What about the times we live in? Friends, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, chapter 14 and verse 7, to fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And after the crucifixion of the cross, after the, co the commission to his disciples, once he ascended to the course of heaven, Jesus began his work as our great high priest, spoken of in, Reve in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1. And after the study of the, uh, study of the prophecy of the 2300 days found in Daniel 8 and verse 14, which is prophetic for 2300 years, and after careful examination, we find that in the year 1844, Jesus entered into the most holy place of the sanctuary in heaven to counsel with the Father to begin the work of the investigated judgment as our great high priest. This is the message that our mind need, need to be focused on during the final hours of earth history, that we are living in the time of the investigated judgment, the anti-typical day of atonement. And if this is not the message being teached or preached from the prophet of every church across the world, if this is not the truth that we are sharing with our friends, our family, our co-workers, or even the common strangers, then we are people that are coming up short, for, short friends. Question, is the plan of, plan of redemption completed during Passover? No. 
What about the second piece? No, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. When is the plan of redemption is completed? After the seventh. And if someone was to tell you that the plan of rede redemption plan had finished at the Passover, just think to yourself, which is symbolic of Christ's death at the cross, that the plan of redemption was completed at 31 AD, what would be your response? Remember, God is not interested in condemnation, but education. Because a person doesn't know or understand the sanctuary or our message. That doesn't mean that the person is lost. This doesn't mean that you are condemned. This doesn't mean that you are, are lost or never had an experience with God. There are many reasons why you haven't heard more about this at your local church. In Acts chapter 17, highlighted in verse, highlighted in verse 30, Paul makes a statement that is important for us to understand. As you may be hearing this truth behind the sanctuary and the plan of redemption for the first time, he said, at the, at the time of, of this ignorance, God wink, winks at. God would not punish you for not knowing the truth. God understands that you are working with the light that you are presented with. To paraphrase, God said, I'll wink at the time of ignorance, but if you leave today, and don't take the time to continue to study the deep truths about the sanctuary, we become guilty of neglecting vital truth. Because in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, once again, the Bible says, study to sow thyself approved. If you willfully or ignorantly deny the light of truth that could, that could further, further your walk and continue, to, and, and continue to live in darkness, God cannot continue to wink at because in Romans chapter 8, the Bible tells us that the carnal mind refused to submit, to, submit to the, itself to the will of God. Therefore, the carnal mind is, the, is at war with God. If this is you, God through Paul said, now commanded all men everywhere to repent. In the same verse of Acts 17 and 30. It's time for you and me to go back to the Bible and not hear what a man says or what a minister say or what the church say or even our parents, brothers, and sisters say. Are you following me? If, it's n if it does not follow up or supported by, thus said the Lord, we should not give even an ear to that person, even if they come from a seminary. Once again, it says, study, study to sow thyself approve. I want everyone to search the scriptures like the Bereans. I want our little, little ones to be able to stand for the truth behind our message that one day come up here and preach the everlasting gospel and say, behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. I think we're good old time. A few more points we're gonna close up here. Once again, in page three of, th yeah, in paragraph three of page 399 of the Great Controversy, the pen of inspiration says, in light matter, the types related to the second advent must be fulfilled at the, pointed, at the time pointed out in symbolic ser service. We, and we looked at that area. How does the shadows help us understand the time? What, what examples can we find in the Bible of a shadow being used to help time? A sundial, 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 11, and Isaiah chapter 38 in verse 8. It was used to help tell the time. The same application when studying the shadows of the service to help us understand the, help us understand the time. What can help us tell time? A sundial. What is the purpose of the sundial? How does it work? When well, the sun comes up in the morning, it casts a light, and that light comes to hit the sundial. And as the light hit the sundial, it casts what? A shadow. And whatever it falls on tells the tells what the time is. The same principle can be applied to the evening as well, except in a different direction, if the moon is up. Let's apply this to the earthly sanctuary, because the earthly sanctuary is a shadow. Remember, the sanctuary was made according to the pattern shown of the heavenly sanctuary. And I just want to add this, uh, another application that we can apply to the sanctuary, and we can view the sanctuary as our prophetic sundial to help us understand the times of the plan of redemption. Because when Jesus Christ, the son of righteousness, the light of the world came, his work cast a light on the sanctuary which revealed to us the plan of salvation, which is the shadow of the work that Jesus is called to do as the Lamb of God and our great high priest. Make sense? Are you, are you beginning to see the picture? 
And we're going to close up right here. There we go. Skipping through. Did you, did you know that the first sacrificial offering found in Genesis predates the Passover and the work done in the sanctuary of the outer courts? At chapter 4, Patriots and Prophets, the pen of inspiration tells us the plan of redemption begins here. It foreshadows and gives us a prophetic example to what took place at Passover and, and in 30, 31 AD at the cross. The work of the Lamb which takes away the sins of the world. But how do we know, somebody is asking, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20, 21, that there was a lamb that was, was slain because the Bible doesn't tell us that, right? In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21, the Bible said to Adam, and to Adam also his wife, did the Lord make coats of skin and cl clothe them after. You don't, you don't see it there. What, who made the coats of skin and clothe Adam and Eve, the Lord? Why? To cover them from their nakedness, which is symbolic of sin. But what animal was slain? Before we answer this question, let's examine what was worn before sin, what was worn, what they worn first. Please open up your Bible to, to Genesis chapter 2. And this is the last study. Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 25. Before the fall, the Bible tells us, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not the same. Let's, let's examine this for a bit because it's a strange statement because if you study the Bible, Isaiah chapter 47 tells us that nakedness and shame go together. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus speaking to the seven churches of, of, of Lycia, in verse 15 said that I know thou works, that thou art neither cold or hot. I would doubt thou were cold, cold or hot. So then, because thou art, art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out, 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 of, out of my mouth. Because thou said, I am rich and increased with goods and had need of nothing. And know it that not that there are wretched, miserable, and poor, blind, and naked. And throughout the Bible, you see nakedness and sin appear constantly. But in verse 25 of Genesis chapter 2, the Bible tells us that our first parents were naked and not a sin. Then in Genesis chapter 3, once sin entered the world, you'll notice in verse 7 something changed. And the eyes of them both were was opened, and they knew that they was naked, and sewed fig leaves together and made, made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of, of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among, among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and, and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the, in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. This is very interesting because in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25, our first parents was naked and not the same. But in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10, they was the same because of their nakedness. Why? Because whatever Adam and Eve have in Genesis chapter 2 is now lost in Genesis chapter 3. Did you know that this is also a part of the plan of redemption as well? To simply help us put our clothes back on. But what did Adam and Eve have on first? We're going to examine some more. Please open up your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalms 104. We're just doing a careful examination here. Psalms 104. It's Psalms 104, and we're going to look at verse 2. When you get there, please say amen. The Bible said, who, who is the who speaking of? God, who cover yourself with the light, with light as with garments. This brings me back, when I, when I first uh, studied this, this brings me back to Genesis chapter 2 and 3. Because Adam and Eve, once Adam and Eve sinned, it indicated that they, they had lost something. Because later in verse 7 of Genesis chapter 3, it showed them sewing fig leaves together to cover themselves. And it's interesting because studies show inside the fig leaves are phagocytes, Magne mag magnesium and other material that can produce electricity. Now, what does electricity produce? Light. So, what was uh, Adam and Eve 
cover it before sin? Light. And what is the purpose of light? Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5 highlighted in verse 13. Ephesians chapter 5 in verse 13. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 13. Highlighted there towards the end, it said, For whoever do it make manifest is light. God wanted to make something manifest, to make something known when he created man in the image of God. And we're going to find an answer here because the Bible never, never leaves us without an answer. We're going to go to Micah, one of the minor prophets. Pre goes to Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7 and verse 9. In Micah chapter 7 and verse 9. Notice what the Bible says. It said, I will, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sin, sinned against him until he plead my cause and, and execute judgment for me. He will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness. What did God want to make his own, want to make known to the world? His righteousness. When he created man in his own image. But unfortunately, once Adam and Eve sinned, the light went out and leaving them in darkness. They attempted to recreate the light by sowing fig leaves to cover themselves. But that was impossible. Because the Bible tells us in the book of John that Jesus is the light of the world. There's another word for this action. And it's very alive today, and that's called self-righteousness. This was an example of someone trying to cover themselves with their own righteousness and, highlight, and highlighted in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 4, all righteousness are as, as filthy rags in the eyes of God. Yes, we are called to be the light of the world, but that light is supposed to reflect Jesus, not ourselves. Friends, there are many of us today walking around with fig leaves trying to be the light of the world. There are many doctrines within Christianity, teaches and practices this, and unfortunately many don't know or understand that their self-righteousness will never, never cover them. Let us pray for them, friends, because we was once in that position. One of the purposes, like I said, of the plan of redemption is to teach us how to put our clothes back on. So let us answer the question, what was Adam and Eve was wearing after sin? Please consider Proverbs chapter 27. In Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 6. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 6. It says, The lambs are for thy clothing. Let's stop right there. When Adam and Eve was given coats of skin to clothe them, what did God use in this sense, in context to the study? A lamb. Unfortunately, what did God have to do to achieve this, this skin coat? Killing the lamb. This is an object lesson in teaching us in order to be clothed once again with righteousness. It comes at a price. It's come from the death of the lamb. And who is that lamb? Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue building because we are still trying to understand the types of shadows to help us understand earlier what we, what we examine. What, what would help us understand the time, help us understand the shadows, a sundown? What is the purpose of the sundown? To help us determine the time. The mornings and evenings, evenings there is something called spring types and fall types at, at, the, beginning, at the beginning of the year and the year, and, and the end of the year. What does the spring, when does the spring types begin at the beginning of the year? and the fall types at the end of the year. And we'll cover that more. And now watch this. There are four types in the spring and three types in the fall. What are these four types? Passover, unlimited bread, first fruit, first fruit, Pentecost. And the fall is the trumpets, the day of atonement, and the tabernacle. Each event point to, to Christ and the work he is called as as the Passover lamb and our high priest of the heavenly sanctuary. The spring types represent the first coming of Christ, and then, was, then there was a long break, Pentecost. Did anybody catch that? I'll help you. Just follow the, the days 
of each event, or oh, well, when each event occur. Then you have the fall types, which represent the second coming of Christ. Were these designs meant to help us understand the prophetic times that we live in? Yes or no? Question, I'll close after this. This is the last one. Once again, where do I go to help us understand the times that we live in? The sanctuary. What do we need to study in the sanctuary? The types. What is another word for types? The shadows. How many shadows? Seven. What are they? Passover, unleavened bread, bread, first fruit, Pentecost, the trumpet, the day of atonement, and the tabernacle. The first four represents the first coming of Christ, while the second represents the second coming. Based on the types of shadows, what time are we living in? The first generation or the last generation? The last. Which shadow tells us that we are living in the final generation? The sixth shadow. What is the sixth shadow? The day of atonement. What work is to be done on the day of atonement? The cleansing of the sanctuary. Is this work done in the court courtyard? Is this work done in the holy place? No. Or, the most, or is it done in the most holy place? The most holy place. Is the plan of redemption done in the holy place or the most holy place? The most holy place. If, if the plan of redemption is complete in the most holy place, then, then that will lead me to the seventh shadow. And what does the seventh shadow represent? Heaven. And when Jesus takes us to heaven, and I pray that we're all preparing ourselves to meet God, we shall reign for how long? A thousand years. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the bread of life that you've given us, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for the many applications and to study this message, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you for helping us to continue to be established in the present truth. Continue to be with us as we go throughout the rest of this day. And bless us now. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.